Hi there, and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. And today we're going to look uh, about the state of emergency uh, declared in Spain in the early months of 1934. Um, If you cast your mind back to some of the podcasts we've recently done on Spain in the prelude to the Spanish Civil War, um, what you'll remember is in late 1933, Um, a right-wing government sweeps to power in the Spanish Republic, led by uh, CIDA, um, the uh, proto-fascist nationalist Catholic movement, uh, led by uh, Guillaume Robles, um, and the uh, crisis for the Republic is that here is a uh, notionally, uh, legitimately elected uh, government that seeks to destroy the very principles that the Republic was founded on. Um, obviously kind of analogous to Nazism, which is um, uh, which has swept to power at the beginnings of 1933, but with the same principle of using uh, electoral means to uh, overturn uh, democracy uh, and the possibility of um, socialism uh, developing uh, in that country. Now, last time, as we saw, the um, right, the forces of the right, the parties of the right, uh, become uh, ever more punitive um, towards uh, the campesinos, the Spanish peasants, who had begun to become uh, beneficiaries of land reform, um, very minor uh, beneficiaries of uh, land reform, under the new republic, it was the intention of the landowners, the the latifundi, um, to sweep away any of the gains made by the peasantry, and particularly to wage their own social war on the uh, peasant unions in the countryside. The idea of there being organised peasant labour was an existential threat to the um, fascistic landowning class, and also to the Catholic Church itself. So the entire establishment of Spain was lined up against the changes that the Republic had made. Hence, when the right seizes power in 1933, the first victims are the poor. This um, pushes the, um, the forces of the left, um, the unions, the socialist parties, Uh, into crisis. Some believe that there are opportunities to resist, others do not. And the establishment of a state of emergency um, in uh, in the Spanish Republic was in part due to the failings uh, and the uh, kind of uncertain leadership um, of Lago Caballero, who was the leader of the Socialist Party, the PSOE, And today what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at Paul Preston's brilliant work, uh, The Spanish Holocaust, that will explain this um, crisis further. So here, Paul Preston explains the onslaught uh, against uh, the poor and against the peasantry. He says, in late December 1933, a draft law had already been presented to the Cortes for the expulsion of peasants who had occupied land in the Extremadura of the previous year, the Cortes being the Parliament. In January 1934, the law of municipal boundaries was provisionally repealed. The CEDA um, also presented projects for the emasculation of the 1932 agrarian reform by reducing the amount of land subject to expropriation and for the return of land confiscated from those involved in the August 1932 military rising. Clashes between the civil guard and the bracheros uh, increased daily. So there was a a war, in essence, waged against the poor um, to reclaim land that was uh, lost uh, during uh, the overthrow of the monarchy and the establishment of the republic. The left viewed the Republic as being under threat, which indeed it was. And by January, or by the end of January anyway, um, the indecision on the left was starting to break through into a call for action. 
um, the PSOE, the Socialist Party, and the, uh, the UGT, which was the General Workers' Union, the largest trade union in Spain, um, both began to uh, abandon the more cautious line that Caballero had um, advocated. Um, the leadership of the UGT actually passes to Caballero, and the, it is the younger members of the party who br- managed to bring Caballero over to more strident rhetoric. He then begins to embrace more explicitly revolutionary terms, though uh, his critics suggest he is rather late to the party. And the um, Federación de Juventus Socialistas, uh, the youth movement, the socialist youth movement, along with the PSOE and the UGT, uh, began to um, receive uh, revolutionary instructions from the leadership of the PSOE. And their organisations across Spain received a series of instructions, 73 um, in instructions, um, which ordered them to create militias, uh, acquire firearms, uh, to establish links with sympathetic members of the army and the civil guard, and to organise technicians, engineers, um, electricians, um, civil, en- um, uh, civil engineers, uh, the kinds of people who, c- who could make transport, sewerage, uh, telecommunication systems work, um, who would be in charge of running basic services when the state uh, obviously would withdraw those or crack down in some way. Very little practical uh, activity is undertaken. There is a lot of rhetoric, a lot of talk, but not a great deal of doing. And much of the rhetoric is highly naive in nature uh, and absurdly over-optimistic. Um, revolutions um, only seem to have succeeded in the 20th century when the state is fundamentally compromised or kind of about to collapse, such as uh, in 1917 in Russia, for example. The problem, of course, is that none of these communications were particularly secretive and most found their way into the establishment of right-wing press in Spain um, that uh, added more fuel to the argument that uh, dangerous Bolsheviks were about to take over. Um, Paul Preston writes, The raucous radicalism of the younger socialists would be used throughout the spring and summer of 1934 to justify harsh repression of strikes that were far from revolutionary in intent. The anything but secret plan was for the revolutionary movement to be launched in the event of uh, the CEDA uh, being invited to participate in government. At this point, CEDA was merely a kind of a, 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 a pressure on government, having a large number of seats uh, in the Cortes. Paul Preston continues. There was no link between the vaguely discussed revolutionary moment and the needs and activities of the workers' movement. Indeed, no thought was given to ways of harnessing the energies of organised labour for the projected revolution. Rather, the trade unionist habits of a lifetime saw Largo Caballero persuade the new UGT executive on the 3rd of February to do nothing to stop any conventional strike action, which was then treated by the authorities as subversive. So one of the key areas um, where there were significant consequences um, of Caballero's uh, move to the left, but his kind of uh, ambiguous and confused move to the left, um, was the fate of the rural workers, the rural proletariat. When the National Committee of the Land Workers' Union, the Federación Nacional de Trabajadores de la Tierra, um, uh, met on the 30th of January 1934, uh, the Moderate Executive Committee stepped down, and it was replaced by uh, younger radicals um, led by Ricardo Zabalja El Gora here from Navarre. El Gora had uh, moved to Argentina to escape the grinding poverty of rural Spain, um, and whilst there had uh, become a trade unionist um, because of the uh, terrible treatment of workers uh, in Argentina, um, and had returned to Spain in 1929. Um, he'd also worked as a, a school teacher and 
was um, a, a prolific uh, figure, um, activist figure on the left, um, and had become uh, a member of the UGT. Um, and in 1932, um, he'd moved to Pamplona, um, where he had established um, a local trade union branch. And the right in Navarre, in Pamplona, was one of the most repressive in the country. Uh, the right-wing uh, government of Navarre um, ignored most of the progressive politics of the New Republic, uh, before 1933, of course, um, and uh, ignored any uh, measures to alleviate the poverty of the peasants. So, uh, El Gora had been a kind of a, a combative figure already um, before the um, decision uh, to make him the head of the FNTT uh, in Navarre. So what El Gora represented was this new generation of radical activists uh, coming into uh, peasant union activism in the countryside, uh, proper kind of class warriors, if you will, who saw things in explicitly class terms uh, and saw Spain in explicitly class struggle terms. Um, these were the sorts of people that hadn't quite existed uh, on the front line of Spanish peasant politics before. And the way in which um, the parties of the right and the new uh, right-wing government viewed people like El Gora were evidence that uh, a crackdown was necessary. And also because the government was dependent on CEDA votes, CEDA really is the landlord's party, and CEDA was going to make sure that its people were represented. And the key struggle in Spain is, uh, in the eyes of CEDA, between the landlords and the peasants. And so there needed to be a war waged against the peasants to put them back in their place. The likes of El Goro began to uh, advocate a, uh, a national general strike. Um, older figures within the uh, UGT particularly uh, saw that this was, or believed that this was a kind of a rash and impulsive uh, demand and were opposed to it. And so again, once again, you have this schism through the left. Um, Right-wing movements throughout the 20th century have always been helped by indecision and division uh, in the left. Junta's and military strongmen throughout the century have always been able to bank on this uh, as a distinct possibility. And the appointment of um, a new uh, Minister of the Interior, Rafael Salazar Alonso, um, signalled to the left uh, that um, any measures that they, they took would meet with kind of fierce resistance. And uh, Paul Preston writes, Salazar Alonso hastened to convene those of his subordinates responsible for public order and outline his anti-revolutionary plans. The head of the civil guard was Brigadier General Cecilio Bedia de la Cavaliera. In charge of the police and the assault guards was the Director General of Security, Captain Jose Valvidia Garci Baron, a crony of Alejandro Leroux, um, a well-known fascist, uh, and a man of strong reactionary instincts. Uh, Valdivia uh, assured Salazar Alonso that they could rely implicitly on the head of the assault guards, the hardline Africanista Lieutenant Colonel Augustin Munoz Grandes, uh, a man who would rise to be vice president in Franco's government. Valdivia reported equally favourably on the civil guard captain Vincente Santiago Hodson, a fiercely anti-leftist head of the intelligence service founded by General Mola, and a colleague of the sinister Julian Mauricio Caravilla. To have such reactionary individuals at his command well suited Salazar Alonso's repressive ambitions. Salazar Alonso made it clear to a delighted General Bedia de Cavaliera that the civil guard need not be inhibited in its interventions in social conflicts. It was hardly surprising that, when a series of strikes by individual unions took place in the spring of 1934, Salazar Alonso seized the excuse for a heavy-handed action. One after another, in the printing, construction and metallurgical industries, 
the strikes led at best to stalemate and often to ignominious defeat. So, here is the moment at which uh, the right truly goes on uh, the offensive uh, in 1934, um, during the, uh, the spring. And what can we learn from Salazar Alonso's um, uh, group, or, or his inner circle? You have uh, people who are notionally civil servants or um, uh, members of the armed forces sworn to the uh, uh, protection of the Republic, uh, sworn to uphold the Republic, but the reality, of course, is that these people are um, politically and ideologically uh, aware of their class position and aware uh, of uh, their, their loyalties and they are ideological, uh, ideologically committed uh, anti-communists and uh, anti-socialists. Um, and they are from, drawn from an entire uh, anti-socialist uh, culture um, in Spain that, as we've talked about before, revolves around the landowners and the Catholic Church. Uh, Catholicism and uh, anti-socialism uh, in Spain have a, come, a, 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 a very close relationship. So on March the 7th, Salazar Alonso declared a state of emergency and he closed down the headquarters of the Socialist Youth, the Communist Party, and the anarcho-syndicalist uh, union, the CNT. Um, this was um, cheered by the head of uh, the leader of, of CEDA, Gilles Robles, um, and he declared that um, as long as the Minister of the Interior, Salazar Alonso, um, defended the social order as it existed and strengthened the idea of authority, then the government would always have uh, CEDA support. In the uh, El Debate um, newspaper, um, a series of articles spelt out what this meant. It meant that there would have to be strong measures against what was described as subversion on the part of the workers, or strike action, that really means. Um, and these were normally workers protesting wage cuts. When the, um, the newspapers that were loyal to CEDA um, demanded the end to the right to strike altogether, the government responded with a statement that any strike that seemed to have political implications would be ruthlessly crushed, which really are all strikes. All strikes are inherently political. Um, the Newspapers on the political right um, assumed that all strikes were political, as did Salazar Alonso. Uh, on March 22nd, for example, El Debate uh, denounced uh, a strike action by waiters in Seville uh, and by transport workers in Valencia uh, and claimed that they were strikes against Spain itself. The government dramatically expanded the uh, civil guard uh, and the assault guard, um, who were the uh, kind of the shock troops of the civil guard, and they uh, reinstated the death penalty, which had been uh, abolished in 1932. However, there is a kind of a schism in fascist thinking as well. Um, for those on the uh, extreme right, uh, the idea of uh, the repression of the working class without war it rather misses the point. The um, whole point uh, as far as the, um, the fascist parties in Spain were concerned was that war should be, or civil war, or some kind of violent, bloody civil conflict should actually be uh, not just the means of repression, but the end in itself, um, the uh, ability to keep the workers in place without conflict um, was kind of uh, a, a mistake, as uh, conflict has a value of its own. For example, Anesimo Redondo, who was one of the co-creators of the Junta de Ofensiva Nacional Sindicalista, which would later become part of the uh, fascist Falange movement um, said that there had been this was a, a, a huge um, error. In January uh, 1934, he wrote, 
Get your weapons ready. Learn to love the metallic clank of the pistol. Caress your dagger. Never be parted from your vengeful cudgel. Uh, the young should be trained in physical struggle. Must love violence as a way of life. Must arm themselves with whatever they can and finish off by any means the feeders and Marxist swindlers who don't let us live. The um, organisation um, that later joined with the party, Falange Española, um, created, which had been created by um, uh, Primo de Rivera, um, whom we've, we've spoken about previously, um, the organisation was funded by the uh, monarchist right, the uh, old um, vested interest groups who had been dispossessed by the establishment of, of the Republic. Um, it was seen by many of the um, monarchists um, who were still uh, you know, at, at large in Spain um, and still kind of uh, present um, that the, uh, an organisation like the Falange, a street fighting uh, fascist movement, would easily destabilise the Republic and the return of the monarchy was ultimately uh, likely to be facilitated to buy this were um, asked if they uh, owned a bicycle with bicycle was really code for a firearm pistol and they were armed with a cudgel or a club uh, when they joined and the point about the phalange is that it was able to thrive uh, under the state of um, emergency uh, created by Salazar Alonso, and it was able to thrive in a culture in which the parties of the right, organs of the state, and the old uh, monarchist uh, groups and um, parties uh, organised together and collaborated together in order to undo any gains normally using violence that the peasants and the workers might have made as a result of the Spanish Republic. The Falange movement was trained by the uh, veteran Africanista colonel, Africanista meaning the Spanish army officers who um, trained and led the Moroccan Berber army units uh, in Spanish Morocco. Yes, the veteran Africanista Lieutenant Colonel Ricardo de Rada and the members of the uh, Spanish intelligence services were also involved in helping the Falange. Um, and there were uh, significant figures from inside the Spanish Republic that were dedicated uh, to uh, waging this kind of conspiratorial action against the Republic itself. The Falange's uh, commitment to violence was articulated in an early speech as if our aims have to be achieved by violence, let us not hold back before violence. The dialectic is all very well as a first instrument of communication, but only uh, but the only dialectic admissible when justice or the fatherland is offended is the dialectic of fists and pistols. Now, as we've seen in the last few podcasts about Spain, the uh, gradual... Um, drift towards violence, the um, constitutional constraints that kept sort of firewalls between violence uh, and politics are gradually stripped away. But it's the Falange Party that really leads the march towards ever greater levels of, of political extremism and assassination. Uh, and it will be, as we'll see in the, the coming episodes on this topic, the Falange Party uh, that would take the lead in dragging Spain rightwards and dragging Spain towards political violence. Anyway, I hope you've used uh, found this useful uh, and interesting, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. All the best. Bye-bye.